Imagine stepping back into a world of flickering gas lamps and cobblestone streets shrouded in mist, where the whispers of scandal and the shadow of mystery linger around every corner. This was Victorian England, a time of grand progress shadowed by the inexplicable. It was an era where scientific breakthroughs coexisted with a fascination for the supernatural, and society's polished surface often concealed stories that were anything but ordinary. From unexplainable disappearances and peculiar obsessions to bizarre phenomena that left both scholars and common folk baffled, the Victorian period was unparalleled in its oddities. In this video, we're diving deep into 30 of the strangest events from this fascinating time in history. Some will make you laugh, others might make your skin crawl, but all will leave you marveling at the curious world of the Victorians. So grab your curiosity and prepare for a journey into the unexpected as we unravel the extraordinary, the eerie, and the downright bizarre tales that shaped this enigmatic era. Now turning to an event that quite literally stunk up Victorian London, let us explore the Great Stink of 1858, a crisis that stretched the senses of a city to their breaking point. Imagine the iconic River Thames, not as the picturesque waterway we know today, but as a revolting cesspool of human waste and industrial filth. For years, London's inadequate sewage systems had simply drained raw sewage directly into the river, which mixed with the runoff from factories and slaughterhouses to create a concoction so foul that it earned the nickname the Great Stink. During the particularly hot summer of 1858, the stench became unbearable. The hot weather intensified the smell, causing it to waft through the streets and into the halls of government. Members of Parliament, meeting in the newly constructed Houses of Parliament right on the riverbank, reportedly doused their curtains in chlorine-soaked cloths in a desperate attempt to mask the smell. Some even considered abandoning their sessions altogether. While the situation may sound almost laughable today, it was far from amusing at the time. The river's contamination had already contributed to devastating cholera outbreaks and other health crises, making the Great Stink a grim reminder of London's urgent need for modernization. Public outrage and the unbearable conditions finally forced the government to act. This led to one of Victorian England's most pivotal reforms, the creation of a modern sewer system designed by the engineer Joseph Bazalgette. His system of underground sewers and pumping stations transformed London sanitation, improving public health and setting a global standard for urban infrastructure. The Great Stink of 1858 may have been an odorous episode in history, but it also served as a crucial turning point, proving that even the worst crises can lead to meaningful progress. And yet, this was just one of many strange and impactful events of the era. Moving forward, we'll step into a tale that promises to be just as peculiar, if not more. As the next phase of the journey unfolds, we find ourselves captivated by the peculiar tale of the Dancing Plague of 1888, an event that left Victorian England bewildered and fascinated. Imagine groups of people suddenly overcome by an unstoppable urge to dance, their movements wild, erratic, and seemingly beyond their control. This mysterious happening mirrored similar outbreaks from earlier centuries, such as the famous incident in Strasbourg in 1518, where communities were gripped by this inexplicable phenomenon. For the Victorians, already steeped in a mix of scientific curiosity and lingering superstitions, this event sparked a wave of bewilderment and speculation. Theories abounded as to the cause of these uncontrollable fits of dancing, some believed it to be a form of mass hysteria, a psychological response to the pressures of Victorian life, which was marked by rapid industrialization and strict societal expectations. Others suggested spiritual possession, a concept tied to the era's deep engagement with the supernatural and religious beliefs. Still, others speculated about environmental poisons, perhaps contaminated food or water as potential culprits. 
Each theory reflected the unique blend of advancing medical science and enduring superstitions of the time. Victorian society's reaction to the dancing plague was as multifaceted as the theories themselves. While some sought rational explanations, others viewed the event as a sign of divine punishment or a manifestation of unseen forces. Public gatherings to witness these afflicted individuals became a bizarre form of entertainment, further blurring the lines between concern and curiosity. The incident highlighted the era's ongoing struggle to reconcile tradition with progress, as well as the social norms that often dictated how such phenomena were interpreted and addressed. The Dancing Plague of 1888 remains an enigmatic episode, a vivid reminder of the complexities of the Victorian psyche and the mysteries that even science could not fully unravel. With this tale of inexplicable movement fresh in mind, let us now turn to another story of intrigue, one that delves into a disappearance shrouded in equal parts scandal and mystery. Now turning to a story that intertwines mystery and scandal, we encounter the puzzling disappearance of Agatha Christie in the year 1926, a case that has intrigued generations. While this event occurred shortly after the Victorian era, its roots lie in the same deep-seated fascination with enigma and the unknown that defined the age. Agatha Christie, already a rising star in the world of detective fiction, vanished without a trace, sparking widespread panic and speculation. Her car was found abandoned near a lake, its headlights still on, and her belongings left behind, creating a scene straight out of one of her own novels. For 11 days, the nation was gripped by her vanishing act. A massive search effort ensued, involving thousands of volunteers, police, airplanes, and even famed authors like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who famously sought assistance from a psychic by providing one of her gloves. The public, swept up in the drama, kept the case in the headlines, their imaginations fueled by theories as to what could have happened to the celebrated writer. Possibilities ranged from amnesia induced by personal turmoil to a deliberate attempt to publicly humiliate her unfaithful husband, who had recently admitted to an affair. When she was finally discovered staying under an assumed name at a hotel, she offered no clear explanation for her disappearance, leaving the mystery unresolved to this day. This incident was not merely a personal scandal, but a cultural event that highlighted the Victorian legacy of curiosity and appetite for the mysterious. The public's obsession with her vanishing mirrored the era's penchant for unraveling riddles and scandals, whether through detective novels or real-life cases. It was a reminder of how deeply the Victorian spirit of intrigue continued to influence even the decades that followed. From this perplexing chapter, we now step into the shadowy world of urban legend, where terror leapt from the streets of Victorian England in the form of a figure shrouded in mystery and fright. Moving forward, we delve into one of the most infamous urban legends of Victorian England, Spring-Heeled Jack, a figure that terrified and fascinated the population in equal measure. First reported in the early 1830s, this mysterious character was described as a tall, sinister figure capable of leaping extraordinary heights, his glowing red eyes piercing through the London fog. Witnesses often recounted chilling encounters where spring-heeled Jack would leap onto rooftops or over walls with inhuman agility, his eerie laughter echoing in the night. Some even claimed he could breathe blue flames, adding a supernatural edge to his already terrifying reputation. Descriptions of him varied widely, with some insisting he wore a dark cloak and a helmet, while others described claws as sharp as daggers. These sightings sparked panic across London, with numerous reports flooding the newspapers of the time. The creature became a household name, and his legend spread rapidly, capturing the imagination of a society already drawn to tales of the unusual and grotesque. Speculation about the identity of Spring healed Jack ran rampant, with theories ranging from a deranged aristocrat playing a cruel prank on the lower classes to a truly supernatural being beyond human comprehension. Some suspected a nobleman seeking thrills by donning a terrifying disguise, 
While others believed the sightings were simply the result of mass hysteria fueled by vivid imaginations and sensationalized media coverage. Nevertheless, the fear he inspired was genuine, prompting heightened security measures and even parliamentary debates about how to address the panic swirling around this enigmatic figure. Spring-heeled Jack was more than just an urban myth. He reflected a society grappling with rapid industrialization, urbanization, and the anxieties these changes brought. The idea of an elusive figure preying on the streets at night played directly into Victorian fears of the unknown and the uncontrollable. The press eagerly fed into the public's fascination, ensuring that the legend lived on. To this day, the true nature of Spring Heeled Jack remains unknown, leaving his story suspended between history and myth. As we leave the shadowy streets of Victorian London haunted by this leaping specter, we now step into a darker chapter where horror took on a far more tangible form in the grisly tale of Jack the Ripper. With the next phase of the journey in sight, we confront the chilling reality of Jack the Ripper, the mysterious figure who terrorized London's Whitecapel district in the late 1880s. Unlike the spectral legend of Spring-Heeled Jack, this was no myth Jack the Ripper's gruesome acts left a trail of fear and violence that echoed through the cobblestone streets of Victorian London. His crimes targeted women, primarily those working as prostitutes in the impoverished East End, where despair and vulnerability provided a haunting backdrop to his horrifying deeds. Over the course of several months, at least five women, referred to as the Canonical Five, were found brutally murdered, their bodies mutilated in ways that suggested a level of skill, perhaps even medical knowledge. The savagery of these murders horrified society, but it was the mystery surrounding the killer's identity that truly captured the Victorian imagination. Letters allegedly from Jack the Ripper were sent to the police and newspapers, one of which, known as the Dear Boss Letter, contained a chilling signature that cemented the name Jack the Ripper in history. These letters, whether genuine or hoaxes, only deepened the intrigue and fed the media frenzy. For the already beleaguered Metropolitan Police, the case became a nightmare, highlighting the stark limitations of law enforcement in an era before modern forensic techniques. The failure to apprehend the killer exposed vulnerabilities in a system ill-equipped to handle such a cunning and elusive predator. The case also laid bare the social tensions of the time. The stark divide between the wealthier classes and the destitute residents of the East End was illuminated by the intense media coverage, which often had a voyeuristic tone, treating the murders as grim spectacles to a fascinated public. Suspicions ranged from local butchers and surgeons to high-ranking officials, and even to royals, with theories about the Ripper's identity growing more outlandish as frustrations mounted. Public fear, combined with a morbid curiosity, kept the story alive, making it one of the first modern media sensations. Jack the Ripper's reign of terror ended as mysteriously as it began, leaving behind a legacy of unanswered questions and unrelenting fascination. To this day, his identity remains a mystery, fueling countless investigations, books, and theories. His story serves not only as a grim chapter of crime history, but also as a window into Victorian fears, class struggles, and the birth of sensational journalism. As we step away from the dim alleys of Whitecapel, our next tale brings a strange mix of humor and disaster as we explore the peculiar London beer flood of 1814. Now turning to the peculiar yet strangely captivating tale of the London beer flood of 1814, we find ourselves exploring an event that perfectly blends tragedy with an almost absurd sense of humor. Picture this, at the Mew & Company Brewery on Tottenham Court Road in London, a massive storage vat containing over 300,000 gallons of porter beer burst without warning. The force of the explosion was so immense that it caused several other vats in the brewery to rupture in a chain reaction, releasing a torrent of beer with an estimated volume equivalent to nearly one and a half million pints. 
The resulting deluge poured into the streets, sweeping away everything in its path. Entire buildings were damaged, basements were flooded, and tragically, eight lives were lost, either from drowning or being crushed under the weight of debris. Yet amidst the disaster, tales of bizarre reactions emerged. Some reports suggest that local residents, instead of fleeing, approached the flood with buckets, pots, and even their hands, attempting to salvage as much free beer as possible. The scene must have been surreal, chaotic, and devastating, yet tinged with an almost comical sense of opportunism. For the brewery, however, the event was anything but humorous. The aftermath saw the company face lawsuits and financial losses, though it was ultimately ruled that the incident was an act of God, absolving them of liability. This strange disaster, while predating the Victorian era, became an enduring tale shared and embellished during Victorian storytelling. It served as a reminder of the precarious balance between industrial ambition and the uncontrollable forces of nature. From tragedy to peculiar humor, the London beer flood not only left a physical mark on the city, but also a lasting imprint on its cultural lore. As this river of porter begins to recede in our journey, the next chapter immerses us in a much darker fascination of Victorian society. The public display of bodies and the eerie blend of science, death, and curiosity that captivated the era. Moving forward, we delve into the eerie and unsettling Victorian fascination with the public display of bodies, a practice that revealed the era's deep entanglement with death, science, and an almost morbid curiosity. In Victorian England, it was not uncommon for unidentified corpses to be displayed publicly in hopes that someone might recognize and claim them. These summer exhibitions, often held in mortuaries or police stations, drew both genuine mourners and morbidly curious onlookers. But this practice extended far beyond mere identification. Educational and even entertainment purposes brought the deceased into the public eye in truly bizarre ways. One infamous example was the display of the Barnum body, a mummified corpse showcased by showman P. T. Barnum, as part of his traveling exhibitions, claimed to be the remains of a Native American or an ancient Egyptian princess, depending on the audience. The body was ultimately revealed to be a hoax. However, this did little to deter public fascination. Similarly unsettling were the mummy unwrapping parties held in wealthier Victorian homes. These events combined the allure of ancient Egypt with a grotesque form of parlor entertainment as attendees gathered to watch mummified remains unveiled, a spectacle that often blurred the lines between scientific study and disrespectful novelty. Such practices reflected a society grappling with a blend of new scientific discoveries and long-standing superstitions. The Victorian period was marked by advancements in anatomy and pathology, driven in part by public displays of cadavers for educational purposes. Medical schools and public lectures often featured dissections, offering audiences a first-hand look at the human body. While intended to advance knowledge, these events also catered to a grim fascination with death that permeated Victorian culture. At its core, these displays highlighted the Victorian struggle to reconcile curiosity with decorum, science with tradition, and fascination with fear. They offer a haunting glimpse into an era captivated by the mysteries of mortality and the human form. As we leave behind the public display of bodies, our journey takes us deeper into the Victorian obsession with the supernatural, where the Fox sisters and their mysterious seances would ignite an entire movement based on communicating with the dead. Now turning to the Fox sisters and the rise of spiritualism, we encounter one of the most peculiar chapters in Victorian history, a movement ignited by mysterious table wrapping seances that enthralled audiences across the era. The story begins in 1848 with the Fox sisters, Margareta, Catherine, and Lee, who claim to communicate with the spirits of the deceased through unexplained knocking sounds. These alleged interactions began in their humble home in Hydesville, New York, where the girls reported hearing strange rapping noises they attributed to a restless spirit whom they called Mr. 
Split foot, using a series of yes or no questions and corresponding knocks, the sisters convinced their family and neighbors that they had unlocked a gateway to the afterlife. News of their abilities spread rapidly and the sisters were propelled to national fame, traveling to demonstrate their talents before captivated audiences. Their seances, which often involved dimly lit rooms, mysterious sounds, and the illusion of otherworldly presence, became a cornerstone of Victorian spiritualism. This movement capitalized on the era's mix of scientific curiosity and deep emotional longing, particularly as many families sought solace for the loss of loved ones during a time of high mortality rates. Victorian society, already steeped in fascination with death, found the Fox sisters' claims both thrilling and comforting. Their performances blended showmanship with spiritual curiosity, creating a form of entertainment that both enthralled and unsettled attendees. However, not everyone was convinced. Skeptics accused the sisters of staging elaborate hoaxes, and some investigations revealed that the mysterious rapping sounds were likely produced through physical tricks, such as cracking their joints or manipulating objects. In fact, decades later, Margareta Fox publicly admitted to fabricating the sounds, a confession that seemed to confirm the suspicions of critics. Despite the admission of fraud, the spiritualist movement fueled by the Fox sisters endured, drawing strength from the public's yearning for answers about life, death, and the hereafter. Mediums, seances, and spirit boards became fixtures of Victorian culture, reflecting the era's struggle to reconcile newfound scientific understanding with lingering supernatural beliefs. The Fox sisters may have been unmasked as tricksters, but their influence on Victorian society was undeniable. They had tapped into something profound, an intersection of entertainment, grief, and hope that resonated deeply with their time. With their mysterious table wrapping paving the way, we move now toward another curious tale of Victorian fascination, the Cottingley Fairies, where photographic proof of the paranormal would again blur the lines between truth, imagination, and deception. Moving forward to the whimsical yet baffling story of the Cottingley Fairies, we encounter a tale that showcases both the Victorian era fascination with the supernatural and humanity's enduring desire to believe in the extraordinary. In the quaint village of Cottingley in Yorkshire, England, two young cousins, Elsie Wright and Frances Griffiths, sparked a sensation in 1917 when they produced photographs that appeared to depict them interacting with delicate, ethereal fairies. These images were taken in a serene woodland setting near their home, where the girls claimed the magical creatures dwelled. At a time when the Victorian love for the mysterious and paranormal bled into the early 20th century, the photographs were received with awe and curiosity. What made this story even more remarkable was the involvement of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the celebrated creator of Sherlock Holmes. Doyle, deeply interested in spiritualism and eager to validate evidence of the paranormal, championed the photographs as genuine proof of the existence of fairies. His endorsement brought the story international attention and lent it an air of credibility, despite skepticism in certain quarters. The pictures, depicting the girls surrounded by fairy-like figures in poses that seemed to dance between reality and fantasy, captivated a public still recovering emotionally from World War I and longing for a sense of magic and wonder. Skeptics, however, were quick to question the authenticity of the images, noting the fairies' oddly flat appearances and the curious perfection of their features. Photographic experts pointed out elements that hinted at possible manipulation, but Doyle and other believers dismissed such criticisms, claiming that spiritual truths might not conform to conventional logic. The photographs, at least for a time, stood as a cultural artifact of how deeply people wanted to believe in the unseen, a yearning amplified by the lingering Victorian spirit of mysticism. Decades later, both Elsie and Francis admitted that the fairies had been crafted from paper cutouts and skillfully staged for the camera. Nevertheless, Francis maintained that she had genuinely seen fairies on one occasion, leaving a trace of ambiguity in the story. 
The Cottingley Fairies hoax endured as a testament to the power of perception, belief, and a culture caught between scientific progress and a yearning for enchantment. As this chapter of Victorian fascination fades, we turn now to a legendary prank rooted in humor and chaos, the infamous Berners Street hoax, where one man orchestrated sheer pandemonium with nothing more than a sharp wit and a pen. Now turning to the uproarious spectacle of the Berners Street hoax, we find ourselves in the London of 1810, where one man's mischief caused an unforgettable day of chaos. Theodore Hook, a well-known writer and composer with a penchant for humor, devised a prank so elaborate that it remains one of history's most notorious practical jokes. Hook, wagering with a friend that he could transform any random address into the talk of the town, set his sights on the unassuming home of Mrs. Tottenham at 54 Berners Street. Armed with nothing but his wit and an extraordinary imagination, he set his plan into motion by sending out hundreds of letters in advance, requesting an array of goods and services to be delivered to her residence. By the morning of November 27th, the quiet street was anything but deliveries of furniture, coal, pies, wedding cakes, and even pianos began arriving in droves. Tradespeople, laborers, and even chimney sweeps crowded the doorstep of the bewildered Mrs. Tottenham, each insisting they had been summoned. Doctors arrived in haste, responding to urgent requests for medical assistance, while clergy appeared ready to offer spiritual guidance. The spectacle soon attracted throngs of onlookers, with curious passers-by and frustrated merchants adding to the growing pandemonium. Hook, relishing the chaos he had unleashed, reportedly observed the scene from a rented room nearby, laughing at the confusion and disbelief that unfolded. The spectacle not only disrupted the neighborhood but also became the talk of London, with the incident reported in newspapers and immortalized in Victorian cultural lore. While the prank was undeniably disruptive and perhaps cruel to poor Mrs. Tottenham, it also revealed something significant about the society of the time. The hoax relied on a precise understanding of social hierarchies and the unquestioning compliance of tradesmen with written requests, a reflection of the rigid class structures and trust in formal orders prevalent in the era. Moreover, the public fascination with the event which blended humor with schadenfreude highlights how Victorians were not immune to the allure of mischief and the absurdities of urban life. Though Theodore Hook never formally admitted responsibility, his name has forever been linked to the Berners Street hoax, a prank that turned a simple wager into a citywide commotion. With this glimpse into the humor and peculiarities of the era, we move now to the curious case of Mary Toft and the Rabbit Births, a tale of deception so bizarre it left the medical community and the public in utter disbelief. Now turning to the baffling and grotesque tale of Mary Toft and the infamous rabbit births, we step into a story so peculiar that it defies belief. In the early 18th century, Mary Toft, a peasant woman from Surrey, claimed an extraordinary condition she was giving birth to rabbits. This bizarre claim quickly caught the attention of local doctors, who investigated with a mix of curiosity and skepticism. Astonishingly, some even validated the claim, including Nathaniel Sunt. Andre, the royal surgeon, who became fully convinced of its authenticity after personally examining Mary, he went so far as to present her case to King George I, which elevated the spectacle to national prominence. However, as the story unraveled under scrutiny, the truth turned out to be far less miraculous. A skeptical physician, Syriacus Ollers, exposed inconsistencies in Mary's account, and when Toft was brought to London for further observation, she was eventually caught red-handed attempting to smuggle parts of a rabbit into her chambers. Under pressure, she confessed to having manually inserted animal parts into her body to perpetuate the hoax, all in a desperate bid for financial support and attention. The scandal left the medical community deeply embarrassed, particularly those professionals who had vouched for the validity of her claims. Public trust in doctors and medical science was shaken, 
highlighting the gullibility of even the most educated individuals when confronted with sensational claims. This bizarre episode did more than humiliate the medical elite. It also became a cautionary tale in Victorian cultural lore, a lingering reminder of how easily deception could masquerade as divine mystery. The story of Mary Toft became a symbol of skepticism, challenging the blind trust placed in authority figures and reinforcing the need for empirical validation in an age when science and superstition often intersected. Her tale captivated and horrified Victorian audiences, revealing both the era's thirst for the strange and its vulnerability to the absurd. As we leave behind this peculiar demonstration of the human capacity for trickery, we move forward to explore yet another gripping phenomenon of the time premature burial fears, an obsession that gave rise to some of the most unsettling inventions of the Victorian age. As the next challenge unfolds, we delve into one of the most chilling obsessions of the Victorian era, the fear of being buried alive. This macabre anxiety was not merely an abstract dread, but a genuine concern fueled by documented incidents of premature burial. Imagine the horror awakening in darkness the suffocating confines of a coffin, each moment marked by the ultimate realization that rescue may never come. Such fears grip the Victorian imagination, partly due to the period's evolving but still limited medical knowledge. Conditions like catalepsy, where individuals could appear lifeless for extended periods, often led to tragic misdiagnoses. In an effort to combat this bone-chilling possibility, inventive minds crafted what became known as safety coffins. These coffins were equipped with features such as bells, flags, or even air pipes to alert those above ground should the buried regain consciousness. One particularly striking design included a mechanism allowing the entombed individual to ring a bell by tugging a string inside the coffin, providing a slim but essential lifeline to the living world. Some coffins even had glass panels installed to allow mourners to confirm signs of life or death before sealing the grave. While these designs were ingenious, they also revealed the depth of Victorian society's preoccupation with death and the uncertainty surrounding the threshold between life and the afterlife. Known cases of exhumations further fueled these anxieties. Stories spread of coffins unearthed only to reveal scratch marks on the interior, haunting evidence of a terrible mistake. Whether these tales were true or exaggerated, they captured Victorian fears poignantly, blending fact with folklore. This morbid fascination with burial reflected the era's broader obsession with mortality, shaped by religious belief and a growing desire for scientific explanations. For Victorians, death was not just an inevitable end, but a mystery to be unraveled, safeguarded against, and even perhaps conquered. The widespread apprehension surrounding premature burial reveals much about the Victorian spirit, a curious blend of innovation, superstition, and the yearning to master forces beyond human control. Safety coffins and the cultural law surrounding them stand as vivid examples of how deeply the fear of the grave permeated Victorian consciousness. Moving forward, we step into yet another extraordinary chapter of this era's fascination with the strange, exploring a hoax that illuminated the vulnerabilities of a society eager for wonder, the Great Moon Hoax of 1835. Now turning to the next peculiar chapter of Victorian intrigue, we encounter one of the most infamous hoaxes of the era, the Great Moon Hoax of 1835. This elaborate ruse began when a series of articles published in the Sun newspaper claimed that astronomers using a powerful new telescope had discovered life on the moon. The articles described fantastical lunar landscapes filled with lush forests, rivers, and even strange creatures, including bat-like humanoids referred to as man-bats. These so-called discoveries were credited to the respected astronomer Sir John Herschel, lending the story an air of legitimacy that only heightened its appeal. The Victorian public, already enchanted by the age's rapid scientific advancements, eagerly devoured the news. The detailed descriptions painted vivid mental images of a thriving moon civilization, 
complete with elaborate temples and otherworldly societies. For many, this was not just a fascinating tale, but a symbol of humanity's boundless potential for discovery. Yet, the stories were entirely fabricated, written by journalist Richard Adams Locke as a satirical commentary on the gullibility of society and the sensationalism of the press. What makes the Great Moon hoax so captivating is how it mirrored the Victorian spirit, a combination of unbridled curiosity, trust in scientific progress, and an almost naive willingness to believe the extraordinary. This era, marked by groundbreaking discoveries and innovations, also saw a blurring of lines between fact and fiction, as the thirst for marvels often outpaced the demand for critical scrutiny. The hoax revealed not only the vulnerabilities of Victorian society, but also its yearning for wonder and the unknown. When the truth eventually surfaced, the public reaction was surprisingly good-natured. Instead of outrage, many viewed the hoax as an amusing reminder of the era's thirst for the extraordinary and the power of imagination. It stands as a perfect example of how Victorian society walked the fine line between scientific discovery and fantastical thinking. As we move forward, we delve into another phenomenon that captured the era's imagination, a topic as combustible as the tales of lunar fantasies, the Victorian fascination with spontaneous human combustion. Moving forward, we ignite curiosity with one of the most intriguing and fiery subjects of Victorian fascination, spontaneous human combustion. This bizarre phenomenon captured the imagination of the era, fueled by dramatic stories in newspapers and the vivid portrayal of such an incident in Charles Dickens' novel, Bleak House. In the story, Dickens described the mysterious death of a character named Crook, who reportedly burst into flames with no apparent external cause. While some readers were horrified, others were captivated, as it mirrored real-world reports of the time that described individuals seemingly catching fire without any logical explanation. Victorian newspapers often sensationalized these tales, detailing charred remains found in homes with little to no damage to the surrounding environment, creating an eerie and almost supernatural narrative. For instance, one case involved a woman reportedly reduced to ashes in her bedroom, with only her legs remaining intact. Such accounts were often paired with lurid descriptions that blurred the line between fact and fiction, leading many to view them as credible despite the lack of scientific evidence. Theories abounded in an attempt to explain these mysterious incidents. Some blamed excessive alcohol consumption, claiming that the bodies of heavy drinkers became highly flammable, while others suggested a supernatural cause or even divine punishment. Scientists of the time grappled with the phenomenon, but without modern forensic techniques, they could neither confirm nor debunk these claims with certainty. It was this ambiguity that kept the fires of public interest burning. However, as compelling as these stories were, many were likely exaggerated or entirely fabricated, often the result of incomplete investigations, sensational reporting, or a misunderstanding of natural causes, such as accidental fires combined with the slow combustion of body fat. Nonetheless, these fiery tales resonate as a perfect example of how Victorian society balanced its thirst for scientific discovery with an enduring fascination for the macabre and mysterious. As we extinguish the flames of this combustible curiosity, we venture into an electrifying tale that shocked both scientists and the public, the mysterious case of the Electric Girl of London. Now turning to the electrifying tale of the Electric Girl of London, we find ourselves amidst one of Victorian society's most peculiar curiosities. This young girl, whose name has been lost to history, gained notoriety after claims emerged that she could emit spontaneous electric shocks. Reports suggested that anyone who came into contact with her would feel a sharp, jolting sensation, as though touched by a static charge magnified to an unnatural intensity. Objects around her were said to move or spark without explanation, leaving witnesses simultaneously fascinated and unsettled. The phenomenon quickly captured public attention, with newspapers and pamphlets speculating wildly about the source of her abilities. 
Some proposed that she possessed a supernatural gift, a claim that resonated with the period's fascination with spiritualism and the paranormal. Others suspected that the girl was a fraud, using concealed devices or other trickery to mimic the effects of electricity. However, a portion of the scientific community sought a rational explanation, attributing her condition to the burgeoning study of bioelectricity, the idea that living organisms produce and interact with electrical energy. Victorian society was at the time enthralled by the mysteries of electricity, a force that seemed almost magical in its transformative potential. The era witnessed groundbreaking discoveries such as the development of electric lighting and advances in electromagnetism, which promised to revolutionize daily life. In this context, the electric girl became a symbol of both wonder and fear, embodying the blurring boundaries between science and the unknown. Scientists reportedly conducted tests to measure her supposed abilities, but the results remained inconclusive, perpetuating the enigma. This strange case reveals much about the Victorian mindset, a society eager to embrace technological progress yet deeply rooted in superstition and curiosity about the supernatural. It also highlights how easily the extraordinary could become the focus of national fascination, even as the line between legitimate science and sensationalism grew increasingly thin. Whether the electric girl was a misunderstood anomaly, a clever performer, or simply a product of collective imagination, her tale serves as a spark of insight into the complex relationship between science, belief, and spectacle in the Victorian age. As the static charge of this peculiar case fades, we now find ourselves stepping into an even stranger realm of Victorian curiosity phantom railways that blurred the line between industrial progress and ghostly tales. Now turning to the eerie tales of phantom railways, we delve into a chilling blend of industrial progress and ghostly lore that haunted the imaginations of Victorian travelers, especially those venturing into the rural landscapes of England. As the railway network expanded across the country, bringing both convenience and transformation, it also ushered in an unexpected companion, stories of spectral trains and haunted tracks that seemed to defy logic. Reports of ghostly locomotives barreling through the countryside, their lights glowing faintly through the mist and their wheels silent against the steel rails, were enough to unsettle the most rational of minds. Some claimed to see trains vanishing into thin air, while others recounted hearing the mournful whistle of an invisible engine cutting through the stillness of the night. For a society grappling with the rapid pace of change brought about by the Industrial Revolution, such tales struck a chord. Railways were seen as symbols of progress, yet they also disrupted the natural rhythms of rural life, carving through ancient landscapes and uprooting long-standing traditions. This juxtaposition of innovation and destruction likely fueled the fear and fascination surrounding phantom railways. Many Victorians believed that these spectral trains were harbingers of doom, warning of impending disasters or tragedies yet to unfold. In some cases, these ghostly apparitions were linked to actual accidents, with sightings reported near the sites of deadly derailments or collisions as though the spirits of those lost were replaying their final moments. Superstition and folklore also played a significant role in perpetuating these stories. The Victorian era, steeped in its fascination with the paranormal, offered fertile ground for the merging of technological marvels with supernatural beliefs. Railways became more than just pathways for physical travel. They were conduits for the mysterious and the unknown, Ghost stories of this kind were often shared around firesides and in train compartments, adding an air of suspense and wonder to journeys through the darkened countryside. Interestingly, some of these tales found their way into literature and art, further solidifying their place in the cultural consciousness of the time. Writers capitalized on the eerie allure of ghostly trains, weaving them into narratives that explored themes of loss, change, and the unseen forces at play in an evolving world. Whether these phantom railways were purely the product of vivid imaginations, eerie coincidences, or unexplainable phenomena, 
They reflect a society in transition, one both excited and unnerved by the relentless march of progress. With the haunting echoes of ghostly trains still fading in the distance, our journey through Victorian oddities now shifts to an even more macabre fascination, mummy unrolling parties that brought the mysteries of ancient Egypt into the parlors of the Victorian elite. Now turning to the peculiar and unsettling world of mummy unrolling parties, we uncover a bizarre Victorian fascination that blurred the lines between curiosity, imperialism, and a stark disregard for ancient cultures. These gatherings, often hosted by members of the elite in the candlelit parlors of grand estates, brought the mysteries of ancient Egypt quite literally to the table. Guests dressed in their finest attire would marvel as layers of linen bandages were peeled away to reveal the remains of individuals who had been carefully preserved for thousands of years. To the Victorians, this unwrapping was not only a spectacle, but also an opportunity to indulge in their obsession with the macabre and the allure of distant, exotic lands. The roots of this strange trend lay in Britain's imperial ambitions. As the British Empire extended its reach into Egypt, a flood of artifacts, treasures, and even mummies made their way back to England, feeding a growing fascination with all things ancient Egyptian. Mummies, in particular, were viewed as both scientific curiosities and status symbols, with owning or displaying one becoming a mark of prestige among the wealthy. However, the practice of unrolling mummies turned what should have been respectful encounters with history into a grisly form of entertainment. Often treated as mere objects, these ancient individuals were stripped of their cultural dignity their remains reduced to novelties for the amusement of Victorian audiences. While these parties were undoubtedly social events, they also carried a veneer of scientific inquiry, with some hosts claiming that the unwrapping contributed to the study of ancient cultures and embalming techniques. However, the so-called scientific value of these gatherings was questionable at best, as the process often resulted in the irreversible destruction of fragile remains. In truth, the fascination with mummies often had less to do with archaeology and more to do with the era's obsession with death and the afterlife. Victorian society, so steeped in mourning rituals and spiritualism, found a strange allure in confronting mortality in such a tangible form. Beyond the immediate spectacle, mummy unrolling parties also reflected the imperialist mindset of the time. The casual disregard for the sacredness of these ancient remains mirrored the way colonial powers often exploited and devalued cultures they deemed inferior. To the Victorians, Egypt and its treasures were there to be claimed, studied, and consumed, regardless of the ethical implications or the loss of cultural heritage. This sense of entitlement, coupled with a desire for novelty and thrill, turned mummies into commodities, stripping them of their humanity and history. Interestingly, the Victorian obsession with mummies and ancient Egypt left lasting imprints on Western culture. From literature to film, the image of the mummy as a mysterious and even threatening figure took root, shaping how these ancient artifacts are perceived even today. Yet, looking back, the mummy unrolling parties of the Victorian era stand as a stark reminder of how curiosity can veer into exploitation, transforming sacred artifacts into mere entertainment. As the last linen fell away and the reality of what lay beneath became clear, one wonders if any in those parlors paused to recognize the profound consequences of their actions. With the echoes of these eerie encounters still lingering, we now shift our focus to a compelling tale of identity and deception, the infamous Tichborne case that captivated Victorian society for decades. Now turning to the extraordinary tale of the Tichborne claimant, we delve into a scandal that not only gripped Victorian society, but also unraveled deep-seated issues of class, identity, and belief. At the heart of this saga was Roger Tichborne, a young aristocrat presumed lost at sea in the mid-19th century. His disappearance left his mother, Lady Tichborne, heartbroken but unwilling to accept his death. 
Years later, her hopes were reignited when a man from Australia came forward, astonishingly claiming to be her long-lost son. Despite bearing little physical resemblance to Roger and lacking the refined manners expected of a member of the Tichborne family, he managed to persuade Lady Tichborne of his identity, largely due to her desperation and unwavering belief. Thus began a legal and social whirlwind that fascinated and divided Victorian England. The man in question, known by his original name Arthur Orton, was a butcher from Wapping, a far cry from the privileged upbringing of Roger Tichborne. Yet his claim was surprisingly convincing to many. He regaled supporters with seemingly intimate details about the Tichborne estate and its family, earning the trust of those who believed in his sincerity. His bold assertions quickly turned into a sensational court case, one of the longest and most bizarre trials of the era in which he sought to gain access to the Tichborne family fortune. What made the Tichborne case particularly compelling was the intersection of social class and public sentiment. Many members of the working class rallied behind the claimant, viewing him as a symbol of ordinary people challenging the entrenched power of the aristocracy. His supporters saw his claims as an opportunity to dismantle the rigid class hierarchy, while skeptics from the upper classes dismissed him as nothing more than a clever imposter trying to defraud the wealthy. As the trial unfolded, the details grew increasingly strange. Witness testimonies ranged from supportive to utterly damning, with some individuals swearing he was Roger and others vehemently denying any resemblance. The court proceedings were rife with drama, including revelations about Roger's life before his disappearance and allegations of manipulation by both sides. The claimant's inability to speak French, a language Roger had been fluent in, was a significant blow to his credibility. Nevertheless, the public remained fiercely divided, and the courtroom became a stage for Victorian society's deeper struggles over truth, privilege, and belief in the power of narrative. Ultimately, the court declared the claimant a fraud, and he was convicted of perjury, spending a decade in prison. Yet, even after his downfall, the case left an indelible mark on Victorian culture. The sheer audacity of Arthur Orton and the unshakable devotion of his supporters revealed just how susceptible society was to deception, particularly when it aligned with personal hopes or social agendas. The Tichborne claimant served as a living reflection of Victorian anxieties surrounding identity and the fragility of trust in an era marked by rapid change and deep inequality. With the echoes of this courtroom drama fading, we next immerse ourselves in the eerie world of Victorian ghost hunting. The formation of the Ghost Club marked the beginning of organized paranormal investigations and revealed how deeply the Victorians were captivated by the mysteries of life after death. With the next phase of the journey in sight, we delve into the enigmatic world of the Ghost Club, one of the earliest societies dedicated to investigating the paranormal. Formed in the mid-19th century, this exclusive group brought together some of the brightest and most curious minds of Victorian Britain, including famed writer Charles Dickens and renowned physicist Sir William Crookes. The Ghost Club was not merely a collection of thrill-seekers, but a serious assembly of individuals united by a shared desire to explore the mysteries of life after death. Their investigations often revolved around seances, spirit manifestations, and ghostly encounters, reflecting the era's deep fascination with the supernatural. What set the Ghost Club apart was its unique blend of rational inquiry and mystical curiosity. Members approached their investigations with a scientific demeanor, seeking tangible evidence of the otherworldly while maintaining a sense of wonder. This duality mirrored a broader Victorian tension between the rise of scientific thought and the lingering grip of spiritualism. For instance, Sir William Crookes, a prominent chemist, applied experimental methods to study mediums, presenting his findings with careful precision. Meanwhile, Charles Dickens, known for weaving supernatural elements into his literature, represented the cultural allure of ghost stories and the human longing to connect with what lies beyond. 
The club's meetings were shrouded in secrecy, adding an element of intrigue to their activities. Participants would share accounts of spectral sightings and paranormal phenomena, often debating whether these experiences could be explained by natural causes or truly pointed to the existence of an afterlife. In an era where death loomed large due to high mortality rates, such discussions provided a sense of comfort and hope for many Victorians grappling with loss and uncertainty. Despite its intellectual rigor, the Ghost Club also faced skepticism. Critics dismissed its members as gullible or overly romantic, accusing them of indulging in fanciful notions rather than hard science. Nevertheless, the club endured, its legacy highlighting the Victorian era's remarkable capacity to embrace both skepticism and belief. By daring to probe the unknown, the Ghost Club not only entertained but also challenged the boundaries of what was deemed possible, leaving an enduring mark on the cultural landscape of the time. As the curtain falls on this shadowy assembly, we move to an earlier chapter of Victorian folklore where fear gave rise to legends and narratives of terror intertwined with the bustling streets of London. Our next tale examines the mysterious figure of the London monster, a precursor in some ways to the infamous criminals that would haunt the city in later years. Now turning to the chilling streets of late 18th century London, we uncover the unsettling tale of the London monster, a shadowy figure who terrorized the city and left an indelible mark on Victorian folklore. Long before the infamous Jack the Ripper, the monster captured the public's imagination, haunting the collective psyche with a series of bizarre and unsettling attacks. Reports described a predator who would stalk and assault women, often slashing their clothing and leaving behind a lasting sense of fear and paranoia. These incidents were not only alarming but also perplexing, as they seemed driven more by a desire to inspire terror than by any clear motive for financial or physical gain. The legend of the London monster spread quickly, fueling rampant speculation and panic as newspapers sensationalized the story. In an era when crime stories captivated readers and urban legends flourished, the monster became a source of both fear and fascination. People whispered about his identity, debated his methods, and speculated whether he was a deranged individual or something more sinister. Even as the attacks subsided, the tale persisted, etched into the cultural memory and laying the groundwork for future legends of lurking predators and mysterious criminals. Interestingly, this early urban legend reflected the Victorian obsession with crime and the unknown, the monster highlighted societal fears of London's growing urban sprawl, where anonymity allowed nefarious figures to operate undetected. This narrative resonated deeply with a population already wary of the dangers lurking in the shadows of their rapidly industrializing city. Moreover, the inability of law enforcement to apprehend this enigmatic figure underscored anxieties about the limitations of policing at the time, adding to the monster's mystique. Though the actual identity of the London monster remains uncertain, some historians believe the hysteria surrounding his attacks may have been exaggerated or even fabricated. Regardless of the truth, the story's lasting imprint on Victorian culture cannot be denied. It served as a precursor to the macabre fascination with criminal legends that would later culminate in figures like Jack the Ripper. By blending mystery, fear, and intrigue, the London monster became one of the earliest examples of how crime could morph into folklore, leaving behind a legacy that blurred the lines between reality and myth. With the unsettling presence of the London monster fading into history, we now find ourselves in the somber aftermath of a royal tragedy. The death of Prince Albert and the profound mourning that followed reshaped the cultural landscape of Victorian England in unexpected and fascinating ways. Now turning to the tragic passing of Prince Albert, we delve into one of the most poignant and culturally transformative moments of the Victorian era. Prince Albert, the devoted husband of Queen Victoria, succumbed to what was officially documented as typhoid fever in the winter of 1861. 
However, the exact medical circumstances surrounding his death remain a subject of historical speculation. Some researchers suggest that underlying conditions or even misdiagnosis might have played a role, adding an air of mystery to this already summer event. His untimely death at the age of 42 sent shockwaves through the British Empire, leaving a void not only in Victoria's life, but also in the hearts of countless citizens who had admired him as a progressive and stabilizing force within the monarchy. The aftermath of Albert's death unveiled the Victorian era's profound preoccupation with mourning rituals. Queen Victoria's response to the loss was nothing short of extraordinary. She entered a state of perpetual mourning, wearing black for the remaining 40 years of her life and transforming her residences into shrines dedicated to Albert's memory. From commissioning elaborate memorials to insisting on daily rituals honoring him, her grief became a public spectacle that deeply influenced societal attitudes toward bereavement. Mourning customs, already significant in Victorian culture, grew even more elaborate and ritualistic under her example. Widows clad in heavy black garments and families displaying intricate mourning jewelry became commonplace, signaling the depth of their loss through outward appearances. This period of collective grief extended far beyond the royal family. It institutionalized a culture of mourning that permeated all levels of society, from the design of mourning attire to the widespread use of post-mortem photography. These photographs, often depicting deceased loved ones carefully posed, served as cherished mementos, highlighting the Victorian fascination with preserving connections to the departed. Even literature and art of the time reflected this preoccupation, with themes of loss, memory, and the afterlife becoming dominant motifs. Albert's death not only reshaped the monarchy, but also left an enduring legacy in Victorian culture. It underscored the era's complex relationship with mortality, where advances in science and medicine coexisted with deeply rooted spiritual beliefs and elaborate death rituals. Queen Victoria's lifelong devotion to Albert's memory became emblematic of undying love and loyalty, elevating mourning from a private experience to a public act of devotion. With this deeply emotional chapter of Victorian history in mind, we move forward to explore how the peculiar origins of modern Christmas traditions were shaped by the same era that embraced both sorrow and celebration. Moving forward, let us unwrap the peculiar and fascinating origins of modern Christmas traditions, many of which were shaped and popularized during the Victorian era. Before this period, Christmas had been a relatively modest affair, often overshadowed by other celebrations throughout the year. However, Victorian England transformed it into the festive season we recognize today, weaving together a tapestry of customs that combined ancient practices with new innovations. One of the most enduring symbols of Christmas, the decorated tree, owes its prominence to Prince Albert, who introduced the German tradition to Britain. In 1848, an engraving of the royal family gathered around a beautifully adorned Christmas tree captured public imagination and sparked a trend that rapidly spread through households across the country. Equally curious is the origin of Christmas crackers, those colorful paper tubes that snap when pulled apart. Invented in the 1840s by a London confectioner named Tom Smith, they were originally inspired by French bonbons and initially contained sweets and small trinkets. The inclusion of the paper snapping mechanism, along with jokes and paper hats, came later, transforming crackers into a staple of Victorian holiday celebrations. These playful additions reflected the Victorian love of novelty and whimsical fun, ensuring their lasting place at the Christmas table. Gift-giving, too, evolved significantly during this time. While exchanging presents had long been a part of New Year festivities, Victorians shifted this practice to Christmas, influenced in part by the growing emphasis on family togetherness. The expansion of the middle class and advancements in manufacturing made toys and other goods more widely available, turning gift-giving into a central feature of the holiday season. 
Interestingly, this shift also gave rise to the commercialization of Christmas, a phenomenon that remains ever-present today. Victorian Christmas traditions were also imbued with an air of mystery and spiritual reflection. The telling of ghost stories on Christmas Eve, for instance, was a popular pastime, reminding people of the thin veil between the living and the dead, a theme that resonated deeply in an era preoccupied with mortality. Charles Dickens famously captured this spirit in his beloved novella, A Christmas Carol, blending the themes of redemption, family, and the supernatural into a tale that has become synonymous with the holiday. Underpinning many of these customs is a fascinating interplay between pagan practices and Christian celebrations. The use of holly, ivy, and mistletoe as decorations harkens back to ancient rituals that celebrated the winter solstice and the promise of returning light. Victorians, ever keen to honor tradition while embracing progress, seamlessly integrated these symbols into their Christmas festivities, giving them new meaning within a Christian context. This blending of old and new helped create the enduring traditions that continue to define Christmas as a season of joy, reflection, and togetherness. As we marvel at the Victorian ingenuity that gave rise to these cherished customs, we delve next into another peculiar phenomenon of the era, a sky filled not with snowflakes but with frogs. Now turning to the extraordinary accounts of frogs falling from the skies, we find ourselves diving into one of the most peculiar natural phenomena reported during Victorian England. Imagine the surprise and bewilderment of those who claimed to witness this amphibian deluge, a spectacle that defied explanation and stirred a mix of wonder and skepticism among the public. These incidents, often described in newspapers and personal diaries of the time, detailed how frogs seemed to rain down during sudden storms, covering fields and streets alike. While it may sound like a scene from a fairy tale, such occurrences were not entirely dismissed by Victorian society, which often sought explanations through both scientific inquiry and fantastical speculation. A leading theory at the time suggested that strong winds or tornado-like vortexes might have lifted frogs from ponds or marshes, carrying them over distances before depositing them elsewhere during rainfall. This meteorological explanation, while plausible, did little to dampen the Victorian fascination with the bizarre. Others, however, speculated that these events were simply exaggerated tales or even outright hoaxes, spurred on by the Victorian love of sensational stories that captured the imagination. After all, the era was rife with embellishments and an eager audience for anything that blended mystery and the marvelous. Yet, for some Victorians, the reigning frogs were seen as omens or divine signs echoing ancient superstitions that connected unusual natural occurrences with messages from the heavens. In an age defined by both scientific discovery and lingering spiritual belief, these events perfectly encapsulated the tension between understanding the world through reason and embracing the inexplicable. Whether a rare meteorological anomaly or an inventive embellishment of the truth, the reigning frogs left an indelible mark on the cultural psyche, serving as yet another reminder of how the Victorians straddled the line between curiosity and wonder. As the storm of frogs clears, we now set sail toward another captivating mystery of the Victorian age, phantom ships that glided through the mists of maritime lore, carrying tales of ghosts and the unknown. Now turning to the mysterious world of phantom ships, we delve into the haunting tales that captivated Victorian imaginations and blurred the line between reality and maritime legend. Perhaps the most infamous of these ghostly vessels was the Flying Dutchman, a ship said to be doomed to sail the oceans for eternity, never reaching port. Victorian sailors and coastal communities alike recounted eerie sightings of such spectral ships, often describing them as faintly glowing apparitions gliding silently through the fog or stormy seas. These accounts were rich with chilling details, torn sails flapping in a windless night, ghostly crews visible on deck, or ships vanishing into thin air as they drew near. The tales of phantom ships, including the Flying Dutchman, 
often served as cautionary stories reflecting the fears and uncertainties of life at sea. For sailors of the era, the vastness of the ocean represented the ultimate unknown, a domain where natural dangers intertwined with supernatural possibilities. In Victorian society, still steeped in folklore and religious influences, these stories often took on deeper meanings. Some believed they were divine warnings of impending disaster, while others suggested they were cursed vessels bearing the weight of past sins or unresolved tragedies. Victorian literature further amplified the allure of these ghostly tales, with writers weaving phantom ships into their narratives as symbols of fate, guilt, and the mysteries of the human condition. Such stories not only fed the insatiable Victorian appetite for supernatural thrills, but also mirrored the growing anxieties of an age marked by rapid technological and social change. The steam engines of progress were at odds with the timeless, untamed force of the sea, making these stories both a reminder of human vulnerability and a source of fascination. Whether rooted in actual sightings distorted by mist and moonlight, or born purely of imagination and fear, Phantom ships became an enduring part of maritime folklore during the Victorian age. With their ghostly allure and chilling symbolism, these tales continue to intrigue, offering a glimpse into a society grappling with the boundaries of reason, fear, and wonder. And as we leave behind the spectral mists of the seas, our journey takes us to yet another enigma, the peculiar case of hoof-like tracks that baffled an entire town and spurred theories of the supernatural in the infamous Devil's Footprints incident. Now turning to the icy winter of 1855 in Devon, England, we encounter one of the most perplexing mysteries of the Victorian age, the Devil's Footprints incident. On a frigid February morning, residents awoke to find peculiar hoof-like tracks etched into the fresh snow, stretching for miles across the countryside. These prints were unlike anything anyone had seen before, cloven, measuring about four inches long, and arranged in a single file as if made by something walking on two legs. What made this event even more baffling was the path these tracks appeared to take, defying logic and gravity alike. They were said to traverse not only open fields, but also riverbanks, rooftops, garden walls, and even passing through narrow drain pipes. The sheer strangeness of these tracks left the Victorian imagination running wild. Some were quick to attribute the phenomenon to natural causes, suggesting that an escaped kangaroo or a hoofed animal might have been the culprit, though how such creatures would navigate such improbable terrain remained unanswered. Others speculated about more mundane explanations involving weather patterns, considering the possibility that melting snow might have distorted simpler animal tracks. But far more chilling theories also emerged, aligning with the more superstitious tendencies of the era. Many believed that these were the actual footprints of the devil himself, roaming the villages in search of lost souls, a notion that played deeply into the Victorian fascination with morality, sin, and the supernatural. Local clergy and newspapers added fuel to the fire, with headlines and sermons warning of divine judgment or offering cryptic warnings about the consequences of straying from righteousness. The phenomenon also sparked heated debates across scientific and spiritual communities, with some attempting to debunk the incident while others embraced it as proof of darker forces beyond human understanding. For the Victorians, still caught between age-old religious convictions and the burgeoning rationalism of the time, such events held a powerful grip on the collective consciousness. Even today, the devil's footprints remain an enigma with no definitive explanation ever uncovered. Whether the result of a mischievous prank, an unusual animal, or something truly otherworldly, this incident stands as a reminder of how mystery can captivate and unsettle especially in an era teetering between faith and reason. And as we leave the frosty trails of Devon behind, we step into the dark streets of Victorian Brighton, where a gruesome series of crimes known as the Brighton Trunk Murders shocked a nation. 
Now turning to the bustling seaside town of Brighton, we uncover a tale of horror that gripped Victorian England like few others, the Brighton Trunk Murders. This chilling series of crimes began in the 1870s, when the bodies of victims were discovered dismembered and stuffed into large trunks, left abandoned in railway stations and lodging houses. The gruesome nature of these murders and the calculated disposal of the victims sent shockwaves through the public, sparking a media frenzy that brought the dark underbelly of Victorian society into sharp focus. What made the Brighton Trunk murders particularly unsettling was the anonymity of the killer and the ordinary nature of the settings where the trunks were found. It seemed as though danger could lurk anywhere in plain sight and this deeply unnerved a society already grappling with rapid urbanization and increasing crime rates. Newspapers of the time seized upon the sensational details with lurid headlines and vivid descriptions that both horrified and captivated readers. For a public hungry for stories of intrigue and danger, the murders became a source of both morbid fascination and growing anxiety about the safety of their own lives. The cases also highlighted the challenges faced by Victorian police forces, which were still in their relative infancy and struggled with limited resources and rudimentary investigative techniques. With no modern forensic tools, detectives had to rely on painstaking legwork and witness accounts, which often yielded frustratingly little progress. Despite the intense public and media attention, many aspects of the Brighton Trunk murders remained unresolved, leaving more questions than answers and adding to the eerie mystique surrounding the crimes. For Victorians already captivated by tales of macabre and mystery in literature and onstage, these real-life events tapped into their deepest fears. The notion of an unknown killer operating so brazenly, hiding their crimes in everyday items like luggage, blurred the lines between the ordinary and the terrifying, amplifying the sense of vulnerability in an era of social upheaval. The murders also contributed to changing perceptions of urban spaces, where the promise of progress and opportunity often came paired with the lurking threats of crime and disorder. As the dreaded trunks faded into history, they left behind an enduring legacy of fear, speculation, and unresolved mystery that still lingers in Brighton's cultural memory. And from this tale of terror by the sea, we shift to another strange event that gripped the Victorian imagination, the case of poisoned chocolates, where the sweetness of a treat turned into a deadly affair. Now turning to the sinister allure of confections gone awry, we delve into the chilling case of the poisoned chocolates, a Victorian scandal that turned sweet indulgence into a source of terror. During an era when the consumption of chocolate was growing in popularity among all social classes, this bizarre crime shocked the public to its core. Anonymous parcels containing chocolate treats laced with lethal substances were sent to unsuspecting recipients transforming a beloved luxury into an instrument of potential death. The randomness of the targets and the sheer malevolence of the act only added to the widespread alarm. For a society steeped in trust and social etiquette, the idea of receiving a gift that could kill was utterly horrifying. It challenged the fundamental Victorian belief in civility and decorum, replacing it with paranoia and suspicion, at the heart of this case was the public's growing awareness of food safety, or rather, the lack of it. Industrialization had brought an explosion in the variety and availability of food products, but it also introduced a slew of adulterations and contaminants to the marketplace. For Victorians who relied heavily on trust in their merchants and manufacturers, the revelation that even something as innocent as chocolate could be weaponized was deeply unsettling. Newspapers at the time amplified the fear, detailing the physical effects of the poisoned chocolates in graphic terms and speculating about who might be responsible. Was this a targeted vendetta, a criminal mastermind at work, or simply a cruel prank taken to deadly extremes? The lack of clear answers left the public reeling, torn between outrage and fascination. 
This case also underscored the limitations of Victorian forensic science, much like other crimes of the period. Without the chemical testing and investigative tools available today, it was nearly impossible to trace the origin of the poison or identify the perpetrator. The lack of closure only intensified the public's anxiety as they were left to imagine their own lives intersecting with such malevolence. The poisoned chocolates became emblematic not just of a specific crime but of a broader unease about the rapid changes sweeping through society, the erosion of traditional safeguards, the anonymity of urban life, and the vulnerability of even the most mundane pleasures. Ultimately, the case of the poisoned chocolates left an indelible mark on Victorian England, exposing the fragile trust that underpinned daily life. It fueled not only stricter demands for food safety regulations, but also a lingering unease about the hidden dangers that could infiltrate even the most cherished aspects of their world. And from this unsettling story of trust betrayed, we now shift our focus to a powerful natural event that mesmerized and mystified the Victorian imagination, the eruption of Krakatoa and the far-reaching ripple effects it unleashed. Now turning to the formidable power of nature, we arrive at the cataclysmic eruption of Krakatoa in 1883, an event whose effects reached far beyond its epicenter in the Dutch East Indies to leave a remarkable imprint on Victorian England. The eruption, one of the most violent volcanic events in recorded history, unleashed an unimaginable force, sending shockwaves around the globe. While the immediate devastation unfolded thousands of miles away, the distant yet tangible aftermath captivated the Victorian imagination. For months following the eruption, the skies over England were transformed into an extraordinary palette of vivid reds, purples, and Orange's sunset so surreal that they inspired awe, fear, and even artistic masterpieces. These fiery skies, a result of volcanic ash and debris lingering in the atmosphere, provided a visual reminder of nature's raw and unpredictable power, stirring emotions ranging from fascination to unease. The unusual atmospheric effects were not the only consequence felt by the Victorians, Abnormal weather patterns, including colder-than-usual winters and unpredictable summers, were attributed to the aftermath of Krakatoa. Scientific curiosity surged as people sought to understand the connection between a volcanic eruption on the other side of the world and the strange phenomena they were witnessing at home. This was an era when science and discovery were at the forefront of Victorian consciousness, and Krakatoa became a key topic of discussion in lecture halls, newspapers, and salons. The eruption's far-reaching impact fueled new studies into meteorology and geology, with scientists striving to explain the global chain reaction set off by this singular event. Beyond the scientific intrigue, Krakatoa left a deep cultural mark on Victorian art and literature. Writers and painters sought to capture the ethereal beauty and haunting strangeness of the sunsets, using them as metaphors for the sublime power of nature and the fragility of human existence. The eruption inspired works that ranged from scientific journals to poetic odes, as creatives across disciplines grappled with the profound implications of a world so interconnected that the actions of an isolated volcano could ripple across continents. This blend of wonder and introspection resonated with Victorian society, which was already navigating rapid industrial and social change. For the Victorians, the eruption of Krakatoa exemplified the dual nature of natural disasters as both destructive and awe-inspiring. It reminded them of their vulnerability in the face of forces far beyond human control, even as it spurred advancements in scientific understanding and artistic expression. And from this union of science, art, and nature, we turn to another figure whose impact on Victorian society was equally transformative, a woman who redefined the role of healthcare, compassion, and innovation during one of history's most turbulent conflicts. Let us now explore the remarkable influence of Florence Nightingale during the Crimean War. 
As the next phase of the journey unfolds, we arrive at the Crimean War, a conflict not only marked by its brutal conditions, but also by the emergence of an extraordinary figure who forever altered the landscape of health care Florence Nightingale. In the mid-19th century, Nightingale ventured into the horrors of war-torn Crimea armed not with weapons, but with an unwavering resolve to combat the unspeakable neglect faced by wounded soldiers. At that time, hospitals were perilous places where unsanitary conditions ran rampant, with basic hygiene and proper medical care often dismissed as unimportant. This neglect resulted in a staggering death toll, not from battle wounds, but from preventable diseases like cholera and typhus. What made Florence Nightingale's method so transformative during this tumultuous period was her insistence on practices that seemed strange and even controversial to her contemporaries but ultimately redefined nursing forever. She placed an emphasis on strict cleanliness, proper ventilation, and basic nutrition concepts that seem fundamental today but were innovative and to some even unnecessary during her era. Nightingale's approach was revolutionary in that it treated not just the immediate injuries of soldiers, but their overall environment, recognizing that many deaths were caused by the conditions in which these men were forced to recover. Her tireless work at the Scutari Hospital reduced the mortality rate there from a horrifying 42% to just 2%, a statistical miracle that earned her the nickname the Lady with the Lamp for her late night rounds of care. However, her methods were not without resistance. Many male doctors and officials initially viewed her reforms as meddlesome or overly simplistic, failing to appreciate how profound an impact they would have. Yet her results spoke louder than any protest, and she leveraged the growing support of the British public, who saw her as a hero, to launch further reforms even after the war. Upon her return to England, she authored what became the cornerstone of modern nursing, known as Notes on Nursing, which laid out principles of hygiene, patient care, and the ethical responsibilities of medical professionals. The far-reaching effects of Florence Nightingale's work extended well beyond the Victorian era. Her methods laid the groundwork for the professionalization of nursing, elevating it from an undervalued, ad hoc role to a respected and essential pillar of healthcare systems worldwide. Additionally, her use of data and statistical analysis to advocate for reform was groundbreaking, reinforcing a scientific approach to medicine that shaped future generations. For the Victorians, Florence Nightingale was not just a symbol of compassion, she embodied the era's complicated relationship with progress, a time when society grappled with balancing traditional beliefs against groundbreaking discoveries and innovations. Her story remains a testament to how one person's determination and vision can drive transformative change, even in the face of skepticism and adversity. And as we leave the shadowed corridors of Scutari behind, we now journey into the spectral world of the Victorian imagination, where ghost stories and supernatural tales captured a society teetering between rationality and the unknown. Let us explore the Victorian ghost story boom, a cultural phenomenon that blurred the lines between fear and fascination. As the next chapter dawns, we delve into the enthralling realm of the Victorian ghost story boom a literary and cultural phenomenon that gripped the imaginations of many during the 19th century. This was an era when the fear of the supernatural intertwined seamlessly with the intrigue of storytelling, producing some of the most captivating and chilling tales that continue to haunt readers even today. Writers like Wilkie Collins, whose works masterfully combined suspense and eerie undertones, and Montague Rhodes James, renowned for his ability to craft unsettling ghostly encounters, led the charge in popularizing the genre. These stories were not merely exercises in spine-tingling entertainment. They mirrored the deep, underlying anxieties of Victorian society. The Victorians were a people caught between two worlds, the old one steeped in religious conviction and belief in the supernatural and the new one, shaped by the rapid advancements of science and technology. Ghost stories became a way for society to grapple with questions of life, 
death and what might lie beyond, all while maintaining the thrill of uncertainty. Concepts like seances, spiritual mediums, and spectral apparitions found their way not just into literature, but into everyday life as people sought to bridge the gap between the physical and the spiritual. The rise of spiritualism, fueled by events like the Fox Sisters' mysterious seances, only added to the pervasiveness of ghostly narratives. These tales often reflected the Victorians' changing perspectives on death. In a time when mourning rituals were elaborate and grief was worn quite literally on one's sleeves, people sought answers to the unknown. Ghost stories offered a form of solace, a way to explore the liminal space between the living and the dead. They posed profound questions about morality, justice, and retribution, often portraying ghosts as restless spirits burdened with unfinished business or wronged in life, a concept that resonated deeply with audiences. At the same time, these narratives served as cautionary tales, warning against hubris, greed, or the mistreatment of others. The ghost story boom also reflected societal fears tied to the rapid changes of the era. Industrialization and urbanization transformed landscapes and ways of life, creating a sense of displacement among many Victorians. Ghosts often tied to old houses, desolate moors, or forgotten traditions symbolized a haunting nostalgia for a vanishing past. They became metaphors for unresolved tensions within society, such as class struggles, gender roles, and the fear of the unknown brought about by scientific discoveries that were beginning to challenge long-held beliefs. Writers like Wilkie Collins enthralled readers with tales that wove together mystery and the uncanny, while Montague Rhodes' James mastered the art of subtle, creeping terror, often placing his spectral figures in settings familiar to his readers, making the supernatural seem eerily plausible. Their works, along with those of other authors, solidified the ghost story as an enduring part of Victorian culture. The genre experienced a particular surge during Christmas time, as families gathered around firesides to share chilling tales, a tradition immortalized by Charles Dickens in works like A Christmas Carol. This fascination with ghosts and supernatural fiction was not mere escapism, but a reflection of a society seeking to reconcile its fears and uncertainties with its relentless push toward progress. The Victorian ghost story boom captured the collective imagination, offering both a thrilling escape and a deeper exploration of the fears and hopes that defined the age. And so, as the spectral figures from these tales fade into the mists of time, we find ourselves at the end of our journey through 30 strange events from Victorian times. But even as we close this chapter, the echoes of their stories remind us of the peculiar and unforgettable legacy this era has left behind. As we bring this captivating journey through 30 strange events from Victorian times to a close, it becomes clear that this era was a remarkable tapestry woven with threads of innovation, superstition, and profound social change. From bizarre mysteries that gripped the public imagination to macabre practices that reflected the complexities of the age, the Victorian period has left us with a wealth of stories that continue to intrigue and inspire. These events are far more than peculiar footnotes in history. They reveal the fears, hopes, and ambitions of a society navigating the uncharted waters of rapid progress and deep-rooted tradition. Even today, the echoes of these tales shape how we perceive the Victorian age, a time when the boundaries between the known and the unknown seem tantalizingly thin. Whether it was the grim specter of Jack the Ripper, the ethereal allure of ghost stories by the fireside, or the strange intersection of technology and mysticism, each story offers a window into a world both familiar and alien. They challenge us to consider how much of our own lives are influenced by the strange and the unexplained, and remind us that history is often far stranger than fiction. Which of these Victorian oddities captured your imagination the most? Let us know in the comments below. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And if you're as fascinated by historical mysteries as we are, don't forget to like this video, share it with fellow history enthusiasts, and subscribe to our channel for more journeys into the curiosities of the past. 
Turn on the notification bell to ensure you never miss our next adventure. Thank you for joining us on this extraordinary exploration of Victorian times, and we can't wait to see you in the next video.